So, um, in the last few classes, we have been um, trying to take um, uh, uh, an approach based on differential equations um, to understand fluid motion. We um, only derived the governing equations, uh, one of them, uh, the fact that uh, you know mass is conserved, there is a mass balance, we express that as a um, differential equation. The second one was the momentum balance or force is equal to mass into acceleration. We um, represented uh, that uh, fact also as a differential equation. Now, uh, we should learn how to use these equations for the kind of problems that we want to analyze. But uh, before that, there is one more, um, um, uh, you know, balance that we often use and that is about energy, right. The energy is conserved or there is an energy balance. So, one can um, use that fact also and write down um, uh, an uh, equation. Uh, that can be quite useful. Now, the uh, we will not do it as rigorously as we did for the mass balance and for the momentum balance. We are going to only um, uh, do it uh, so that it looks um, very similar to something that you are already familiar with and that is Bernoulli's equation. Okay? So, we are going to see how energy conservation is nothing but um, similar to what you already know the Bernoulli's equation and how um, does it get modified really for a um, uh, real fluid flow. So, we are going to now um, look at uh, Bernoulli's equation, we will try to derive that. Okay. So, let us say you have some uh, flow field. So, that means there is a velocity, there is a pressure and let us also in general assume that you know the density is also changing. So, that we do not have to restrict ourselves for incompressible uh, fluid flows and, uh, uh, and let us say we will consider a differential element. So, uh, for this particular one, we are going to really write down just uh, uh, energy balance as a 1D equation. Okay. So, we will not consider therefore, a cubic element, we will consider something simpler. Let us say a fluid element okay, which is made of, which is actually a stream tube. I will explain what is a stream tube. Let us say that is a stream tube. Stream tube is something that is made up of streamlines. So, you take the surface uh, of the stream tube, the surface of the stream tube is made up of streamlines or made of streamlines. What are streamlines? Streamlines. So, if you know a streamline and if you draw a tangent at a particular on this on the streamline that is actually going to give you the velocity field. So, let us draw some streamline. Okay. Let us say that is a streamline. If you take a particular point and let us say a tangent there, that is actually going to give you velocity field. If I take another point and draw a tangent there, so let me draw the tangent with a different color, that. Okay. So, that is going to give me the velocity there. If I have here, that is going to give me the velocity field here. Okay. So, streamline is essentially connected by those velocity vectors. So, if there is a change in the direction of the flow, streamline will show that. So, so you can draw streamlines at every point in the flow field. So, stream tube is basically a surface made up of such streamlines. So, for us that means that if this is what the stream tube is, if I take any point and draw a tangent that is basically going to be the direction in which the fluid is flowing. There cannot be a fluid motion that is perpendicular because by definition streamline is the one which is drawn such that the velocity is tangential to it. Okay. In other words, if you consider a stream tube because there is you can't th that is made up of streamlines, there cannot be a flow from 
in or out. So, there is a flow that is going to go in okay, and there is a flow that is out. So, this is this is in that is out. So, this is like really a tube and then there is fluid that is coming from the left side and then the fluid is going to go outside. But on the surface because it is made up of stream tube there is no flow through the surface. So, it is the stream tube is as if it is like a rigid object for that matter because there is no flow that is going to go through the stream tube, but it is really made up of fluid element. Okay, So, that is the stream tube that we are considering. Let us say this side the pressure is P, density is rho, velocity is V and outside it is P plus D P is the pressure, rho plus D rho is the density, V plus D V is the velocity and there is a change in area. So, there could be a change in area because fluid need not just go straight, fluid probably would be expanding and flowing like that, the fluid might be flowing like that. So, you could you have an inlet area let us say A and let us say the outlet area is A plus D A. So, this is the system under consideration and what we will do is we will write down a mass balance and a momentum balance for this particular fluid element that we have considered. So, we already know how to do it, we can say that the mass in minus mass out should be equal to rate of change of mass in the system. So, so if you think about mass balance, so mass in minus mass out has to be equal to rate of change of mass inside, right. So, what is the mass um, that is flowing into the uh, system that is going to be volumetric flow rate times density, but volumetric flow rate is nothing but the area times velocity. So, rho times a times V is the mass that is going in minus the mass that is coming out is going to be rho plus D rho times A plus D A times V plus D V and that has to be equal to the rate of change of uh, mass which is del by del T of the mass in that area. So, let us say the, so sorry in that volume, so the volume is given by um, some area times uh, particular length. So, let us mark the length also, let us say from the center to here the length is given by d s ok and also let us say that this is actually at an angle theta with respect to the horizontal. So, the rate, so the uh, the volume of this is going to be approximately equal to A times d s times density is going to be the rate of change of mass in the system. So, this, this is nothing but really change in A rho into A into V. So, let me rewrite it as differential of rho into A into V with the minus sign because it is um, uh, left minus right is equal to del by del T of rho into A times d s. Okay. Or uh, for the given element, we could therefore write it as del rho by del t um, times a into d s is equal to minus d of rho v times a. So, A is a particular area that you have considered and D is the 
total length of the the a differential length of the fluid element that you have considered ok. So, that is what the mass conservation equation gives you. So, now we will write down the linear momentum equation. So, linear momentum equation is nothing but again momentum in minus momentum out has to be equal to the rate of change of momentum, but we also know <coughs> that the rate of change of momentum can come from forces. So, we could write that in momentum minus out momentum has to be equal to rate of change, but that rate of change can also come from all the forces acting in the system. Remember that is a fact that we used to write down the momentum conservation equation. So, for this particular fluid element that we are looking at ok. So, there is a force there is a force that is coming from pressure, there is gravity that is acting and uh, then um, there could be viscous forces and then we can also calculate what is the momentum that is going in, what is the momentum that is going out ok. So, let us start with the right, right hand side, the rate of change of momentum can be written as del by del t of momentum of the fluid. So, that is mass ok. So, that is den density into volume uh, times V. So, that is the rate of change of momentum in that volume that is equal to the differential of the momentum in minus momentum out. So, just like the mass conservation we can write it as this is basically minus d times rho into a into v which is the volumetric flow rate times v sorry the mass flow rate times v which is the momentum flux ok or momentum flow rate plus sum of all the forces acting in the system. Now, here now we need to write down what are the forces ok. One obvious force is uh, the body force ok. So, the body force which is coming from gravity. So, what will be the body force is nothing but just the weight of the system. So, here we have A as the inlet area, D S is the length and uh, uh, and what? and then gravity is acting downwards only thing is that so gravity is acting downwards, but the element is actually uh, you know uh, up like that in at a particular angle. So, we need to find out the component of gravity that is acting along the d s direction ok. So, this is the direction that we are trying to see now that is the direction ok. So, we are writing down the force balance in that direction. So, in the direction of that pink arrow. So, we have to find out what is the way what is the component of gravity that is acting along it and that is going to be nothing but so because um, gravity is acting downward. Okay. So, that is the direction in which gravity is acting. So, it is going to be g sin theta that is going to act in that particular direction. So, body force is going to be uh, area times length A d s is going to give you the volume times rho volume times density that is the mass times g sin theta and it is acting. Uh, so, g um, is acting downward. So, it is minus g sin theta because it is acting at an angle theta with respect to the uh, horizontal ok. Now, so let me make a smaller diagram here. So, that is the direction in which G is acting. 
that's a kind of fluid element that we were really looking at and we said that is nothing but ds right the length of the element let's say this in edge okay from a particular base is at a height z1 and the out edge is at a height z2 so if i make a triangle there with that angle theta so this is ds this is z2 minus z1 let me call it dz then sin theta is equal to dz divided by ds or ds sin theta is simply dz so i can use that ds sin theta here and write this as minus a rho g times dz okay so that's what the body force is now we have got surface forces and we know that surface forces are two types one is pressure the other is shear stress okay what we are going to do is we are going to neglect shear stresses so we know that shear stresses uh, is basically um, arising from viscosity or it is due to friction so by really neglecting shear stresses we are talking about frictionless fluid so if there is a fluid which was not having any viscosity okay it does not feel any friction that was the case then there is no shear stresses and that's the case that we are going to look at and then we will correct it later on how to account for friction so the only force that we are the surface force that we are worried about really is the pressure force so let me make a diagram again to rep tell what is the best way to do it so that's our diagram that we are looking at we said um, there is an inlet pressure and then there is an outlet pressure so so p there is a p that's acting on the inlet and there is a p plus delta p that's acting at the outlet but we know that it's only the difference in pressure that's going to create a force and therefore let's say that the force at the inlet okay or the pressure here is zero and the pressure at the other side is simply dp because dp is the one that's going to really constitute the pressure here we have an area a and here we have an area a plus da okay so the net force acting is simply going to be dp times a plus da in this manner right but the point is that if you write it as a times dp plus dp times da and we are looking at really a differential element where any of these differentials actually the values go to zero where dp goes to zero da goes to zero so in a, this quantity is going to be much smaller than adp or in other words the effective pressure force that's going to act is going to come mainly from adp so look at this when i write down the force okay this is the force arising from pressure force from pressure is what i have calculated which is basically based on the inlet side and the outlet side but there is actually a pressure contribution that's going to come also from the periphery okay from the lateral sides i have neglected it because that's again going to be a small number and you could actually show that that's going to be much smaller compared to the contribution that i have identified here okay but let's not worry about how to show that at the moment let's see that it's a into dp is the net force that's going to be acted and that's going to act in the direction opposite of your um, ds and therefore the pressure contribution is going to be nothing but minus a into dp so putting all of them together we have minus a rho g dz that's a force so where what am i substituting i'm substituting it here 
k and substituting it into that expression. I have the force, I have the change in the momentum and uh, the rate of change. So, minus a rho g d z is the uh, force minus a d p is equal to minus we have a uh, sorry plus, uh, uh, d into rho a v v plus d into a rho v square plus del by del t of rho into a into v d s rho into a into v times d s. So, that is the expression that we have. Let us expand this. Now, if you look at the mass equation that we have derived, which is that del rho by del t times a d s is equal to minus do rho v a or equivalently del rho by del t plus a times a d s plus d times rho v times a is equal to 0. Okay, so, um, so we have got the right hand side. So, we are going to now um, simplify the terms on the right hand side using the product rule. So, for convenience this I will write it as d of rho into a into v times v which is d into rho a v times v plus rho a v into d v plus then uh, is what you have as this part. Then here this is going to be del by del t of rho into a v d s plus a d s into del into rho into del v by del t. So, as far as time differentiation is concerned a and d s are constants. So, rho into v is what I need to really differentiate. So, I have taken the derivative of rho with respect to time times everything plus the differential of velocity with respect to time multiplied by everything. Now, if you look go back and look at your continue or oh, this can be written down um, uh, or we let us look at the continuity equation. So, if you look at the continuity equation you will see that del rho by del t into a d s is minus d rho v into a or it could also be written as del rho by del t into a d s plus d into rho v a equal to 0. And you can identify these two terms in this equation. So, you can identify that del rho by del t into a v d s and d of rho into a into v. Okay. So, these two terms are exactly the terms that you have in your mass conservation equation and therefore, they basically add up to 0 and what you have left is now a rho d s into do v by do t plus rho a v d v plus a d p plus a rho g d z is equal to 0. We will cut our a from all of them and therefore, we get do v by do t times d s plus I will divide throughout by density v d v plus d p by rho plus g d z is equal to 0. Okay. So, this is really an unsteady Bernoulli's equation written in a differential form or if I integrate it then I could write it as dou v by dou t d s integrated from some s 1 to s 2 plus v d v integrated is really uh, v 2 square 
minus minus v1 square by 2 that is integral of v dv plus integral dp by rho integrated from one p1 to p2 plus g of z2 minus z1 is equal to 0. So, this is if I integrate from point 1 to point 2. Now, if I take the assumption that let us say we are worried about steady state flows or steady flows okay, where time dependency is not there, then I will not consider <coughs> this term and I will also say that rho, rho is a constant and if rho is a constant, I could take rho outside from this integral and therefore, this integral is just integral dp, integral dp is nothing but p2 minus p1. So, we get v2 square minus v1 square by 2 plus p2 minus p1 by rho plus g times z2 minus z1 equal to 0 or writing in a nicer form p1 by rho plus v1 square divided by 2 plus or we will write p1 by rho g plus p v1 square divided by 2 g plus z1 is equal to p2 by rho g plus v2 square by 2 g plus z2 and that is the familiar equation that um, is uh, called the Bernoulli's equation right. Now, let me just tell you the assumptions that went in in deriving that equation because that tells you when you should be using Bernoulli's equation ok. So, we started of course, with a um, uh, simple um, you know differential element we are actually doing a in a 1D fashion we are just worried about the direction which we called as ds. We calculated the mass balance, we calculated the momentum balance and the first assumption that we made is about the friction and frictionless fluid ok. We said the fluid has no friction ok. So, that is one that is important because then the, that means Bernoulli's equation should be applied only when your fluid has really no friction. Now, the second assumption that we made is that it is applicable only for steady flows. Third is that we are assuming that the density is constant ok. So, these are the three cases, um, these are the three assumptions that have really gone in in deriving the Bernoulli's equation. Now, uh, so let us let us see what these means ok uh, or let me just give you this. Um, so, pressure this first term is typically called pressure head ok. This is called velocity head and then of course, then height ok. Some height so head really means some height. So, why is it called um, before that? Uh, so, what are these terms ok? So, this is really nothing but the pressure work or the work ok. So, the work is done but so by the pressure right. So, whenever the fluid is moving pressure is a force that is acting and there is a the fluid is moving. So, there is a force times velocity that gives rise to a work in the uh, work on the fluid. So, pressure P this first term really represents that work that is done on the fluid ok represents the potential energy. So, this is really kinetic energy, this is really potential energy and then there is a pressure work. So, it says that if you look at pressure work and kinetic energy and potential energy that sum remains constant ok along any point that you along any streamline that you consider ok. So, if you consider two different points and write down the kinetic energy plus potential energy plus pressure work if the fluid has no friction and if it is steady state and is incompressible then you can apply Bernoulli's equation and uh, that is why this is actually an energy balance. So, this equation that we have derived really is an energy balance. Uh, yeah, so the other thing that I wanted to tell is about pressure head ok. So, what would be the units of pressure head? 
but not this equation right now the written it's in a way it's written that you have an z1 so this quantity now has the dimensions of length so any the equation should be dimensionally homogeneous okay each term should have the same dimension so z1 has the dimension of length then v1 square by 2g should also have the dimension of length and you can verify that similarly pressure by rho g will also have the dimension of length okay so this equation now is written in such a way that each term the such as pressure head velocity head all of them have the dimensions of length okay so we are really expressing energy in terms of length so for example when you have potential energy and you say oh the potential energy is really dependent upon the height at a particular height it is similarly kinetic energy is expressed as a height pressure work is also expressed as a height now therefore if you say that your fluid is actually not frictionless but there is a friction okay so if it has friction that means that certain amount of energy is lost due to frictional forces okay because of frictional forces some energy is converted into heat so in other words the action of viscosity between fluid layers result in generation of heat okay typically that number is very small and therefore you will not worry about um, i mean the number need not be small but if you actually convert it into temperature that may be very small so typically you don't consider temperature variations but still there is an energy loss okay so we can say that if you had a pressure head a velocity head and then you know there is a potential energy and a part is lost due to friction then you will say that there is a head loss in the system okay so for a frictional fluid you can say that your equation is really p1 by rho g plus v1 square by 2g plus z1 let's say that's the energy that's in is equal to p2 by rho g plus v2 square by 2g plus z2 plus a quantity hf which we will call now as a head loss okay so that's energy that's lost in the system okay so you can see that that loss would essentially be a positive quantity because there will always be friction invariably so that particular number or the particular quantity that um, comes up will always be positive on the other hand let's say if you are applying this equation to a pipe okay a long pipe and then you have fluid in which you will call one and then you have two then you can actually apply Bernoulli's equation between point 1 and point 2 and you could write down the equation where now you have to you can you have to say what is the hf or your idea most of the times would be to find out what is hf on the other hand let's say if you put a pump okay some pump in between so that's a pump what does the pump do pump would give you energy into the system so one one way of writing it is that if you want to write you could say you have an hf then you can say minus h pump okay because hf is the loss in energy pump is going to give you energy into the system so you can again talk about a pump head okay or head th thanks to the pump okay so that energy that's input into the system you can call it a pump uh, head so um, typically we will uh, worry about that equation if you have a pump you know how to add it or if you have something which is extracting energy like for example a turbine so then you have to re re remove that turbine head okay so depending upon what you have in the system you can keep adding or subtracting different heads so that's really the energy balance mm -hmm.